Okay, so this is uh, week eight. And today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some inequalities. For <clears throat> probability work, right? So uh, let's recap uh, some results that we learned last week. So last week we talked about uh, Markov's inequality. So Markov's inequality um, goes as follows. This one, um, this is a general form, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is a general form, and um, of course, if your x is uh, non negative, if your x is non negative, then the absolute value will, will not have any effect on it. So so then you would have something simpler like this, okay? All right. So, uh, but this is a general form, right? Keep to the general form. <clears throat> okay, then from um, Markov's inequality uh, implies Chebyshev's inequality. So you can you can uh, uh, you do a replacement. Simply do a replacement of y x uh, x with uh, centered. Right. So generally, uh, so this is mu. So you would have um, sorry. bounded by a variance of x over alpha uh, square. Replace and then choose uh, k equals to two, right? So the Chebyshev's inequality is, is a special case of your Markov's inequality. Now, um, this is the general form for your um, for your Chebyshev's inequality, right? So uh, I think in in the in some textbooks, right, you may have come across some formula like this. So let's say uh, for this part, right? You take uh, alpha equals to k sigma, right? Where your your variance of x is sigma squared, okay? So then uh, you basically will get this result bounded by um, sigma square over k square sigma square so 1 over k square right okay so this is the uh, Chebyshev result uh, Chebyshev inequality that you may have come across uh, in in some uh, studies previously all right which basically says that the uh, in layman's word, it says that the probability that uh, uh, random variable, uh, sorry, uh, uh, realization, right, of a random variable escaping from mu by more than k uh, standard deviation is bounded by 1 over k squared okay so you can verbal you can actually verbalize it right 
So let's look at some examples, okay? Uh, let me clear some things here. So some examples. Um, so you take k equals to one. Right, so your the chance that you escape from the mu, if you take a random set, that means basically let's say you have some distribution. Doesn't have to be normal, it has to can be any distribution. So this is a distribution, right? So this is uh uh, mu minus sigma, this is mu plus sigma, right? The chance that you get something like uh, escaping, right? So if you fall somewhere within here, that is not, right? It's within uh, sigma. Uh, but if you get something else, you are basically escaping from within sigma, right? It says that the chance of this happening uh, will not be higher than, in this case, uh, well, this is trivial, right? This bound is very loose, right? In this case, just say that it won't be more than one. Of course, it won't be more than one, right? So k for k is one. Uh, k equals to one is trivial. So you can see that Chebyshev's bound is not very sharp, huh? right? It's basically just a bound that is is used later. You will see that is primarily useful for limit theorems, right? Uh, which means uh, if you take limit of n tending to infinity, that kind of situation. Uh, otherwise, you want to use it as a bound for, like a, a bound for estimation. It is basically not very useful. So let's see if you take k equals to two, the chance that is more than two standard deviations. Uh, so this this will be two standard deviations. That means escaping here. It says that cannot be more than one over four. All right, and so on. Okay. So this is very, uh, what we call a very conservative bound. Okay. Right, so at least it tells you that, um, well, if, if you find that somebody uh, give, says that uh, certain properties are certain values, but it violates uh, Trebyshev's inequality, then uh, it cannot be true. Yeah? The Trebyshev, because the Trebyshev's inequality is very conservative. So if it doesn't, if it violates it, then there's something wrong with the uh, result that people give you, right? Okay, so these are the two inequalities. And then we have the next one. The next one is called uh, Cantelis inequality. Okay, I think there are some members here who are in my body group, right? And we are working on a, uh, some topic called the Stigler's law, uh, Stigler's uh, law of eponymy. You, you, you basically can check whether these three inequalities are named after the person who found them or not, right? That, that will be an interesting uh, check right um anyway the the law says that uh, most of the theorems in mathematics are not named after the person who first discovered them but they are rather usually named after the person who made them popular uh, through writings or some other theoretical work not not usually attributed to the discoverer usually the discoverer is uh, buried in anonymity okay uh this is somehow of a strange uh situation but maybe not so strange uh, because uh, sometimes we discover certain things um, its value is not appreciated right until until somebody else uh, comes along and say oh wow you know I can use it like this but then uh, since he's the person who shows that it can be used in certain ways then uh, people remember this person right rather than a person who first discovered so maybe that that kind of uh, phenomenon is quite common in real life. Okay, uh, Cantelis inequality. So we have um, the following result.
Okay, it's bounded by uh, the following. Uh, how to show? This seems very curious, right? This seems to be a very curious result. So this sigma square is equal to the variance of x, right? Of course, your alpha is positive. Your mu is expectation of x, right? Okay, uh, to do so, we, we do the following, right? Um, we call it, we use the so-called uh, extended form of Markov's inequality. Um, so the following, so the property that, uh, so let me see. Um, so first I simplify this, yeah? Let y equals to x minus mu, yeah? Okay, so, um, so this result, um, this is equal to P, Okay, so so here you see you are adding, uh, you add a constant on both sides, right? So so uh, it's okay, right? Yeah, and then you square this. It's also okay. Okay, so this is uh, this is equivalent, yeah. Right, because again, you are applying the same uh, operation, right? You square on both sides. Okay, and then over here, uh, you apply, uh, then at this step, you apply uh, Markov's inequality. So this will give you uh, the bound, right? Expectation of this guy, right? Y plus beta squared. Okay, so, so this is one whole thing. And uh, over alpha plus beta squared. So again, you treat this as an entire object, right? So basically, this is just a Markov's inequality. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is what we call an uh, extended form of Markov's inequality, which basically uh, is uh, you do this uh, two steps and then you get this. Now to continue, uh, we know the following, the variance of uh, y plus beta is equal to the following, minus So uh, the expectation of y plus uh, beta square is, so this one is uh, basically, the left hand side is basically just variance of y, right? Because uh, b is a constant, so it disappears. So it'd be sigma square plus this guy, right? This will be uh, beta square because this part is uh, expectation of y is uh, zero, yeah? Because this is a centered form, yeah? Okay, it's a centered form. So, so your expectation of y plus beta is uh, just basically zero plus beta. All right. So you basically have this expectation is equal to sigma square plus beta square. So you get, so you come in here, so you get sigma square plus beta square over alpha plus beta square. Okay. So this is the, uh, so after doing, so, so I have this main part. Uh, so now I, I got this inequality. Now, once you have this inequality, note that because your beta is artificial, right? You is basically uh, what we call a nuisance parameter, okay? 
it is actually uh, not something that you want to consider at the end, but it's useful as a kind of a intermediate uh, for intermediate work, right? So okay, uh, you introduce a constant beta which is positive, and you manage to get this inequality, right? The probability that y greater than or equals to alpha is bounded by this thing involving beta. Now. For it to be useful, you, you basically need to make sure that you have to choose your beta such that uh, this bound, right, is as small as possible, right? Because we know that uh, bounds, uh, if this bound is very large, it's basically useless. For example, if you say that the probability of y greater than or equals to alpha is bounded by two, that's basically a useless statement, right? Because uh, we, all, we know that probability values, uh, probability measures are bounded between zero and one by, by, uh, uh, by definition, right? So if you get the bound uh, being something that is large, right, it's not desirable, right? So that means you have to uh, find some kind of a combination of beta such that uh, this bound, right, is as small as possible. Okay, so this is the uh, idea now, right? How we can uh, simplify. So the simplest way to do this in this case would be to, to use a differential calculus, right? So you'll take the derivative of this uh, bound with respect to beta, right? And you try to solve. Okay, so this is what we are going to do. So let me erase something. So uh, you take the take the derivative with respect to beta. Right, right. So let's just do some calculus here. Um, times uh, two beta plus. times uh, two alpha plus beta, right? And then over here is alpha plus beta squared. So get power of four. So uh, you, you want to force this to be zero. So you can see that um, basically, So basically, uh, the equation will be, so you factorize, yeah? So you basically factorize to uh, alpha plus beta. Okay. And then you have, um, okay, basically this alpha plus beta. So the two is common, so come out like this. Okay. Um, Plus. Oh, sorry. I I think I this is a minus one. It is a minus, yeah. So this is a minus. Uh, alpha square plus, sorry, sigma square plus beta square, okay? Let's go to zero, right? So basically your alpha and beta are both positive, so, the, so you have to uh, find it from here. Okay? So from here, uh, so basically what do you have? So expand, you get alpha beta plus beta square equals to sigma square plus beta square, right? For it to be zero. So beta square disappears and therefore you have beta is equal to sigma square over alpha. 
Okay, so this is the value that um, will minimize your your um, your bound here. Okay, minimize your bound. Of course, uh, to be rigorous, you you need to check the second order derivative, but uh, that's a bit tedious, so we will skip that. Yeah, but if you want to, you can check it, and you can find that the second order derivative uh, is positive at this particular value, right? So anyway, so you substitute this inside, so you will get the bound as sigma square plus sigma square over alpha square. It's a uh, so sigma power four, yeah. Okay, because it's a beta square. So over uh, alpha plus sigma square over alpha square, right? So this one, if you uh, so for this, you, I leave it for you to complete. Uh, so it's just basically some simple algebra here. You you simplify and you will get uh, you will get this result. Okay. So it's a it's a nice result, yeah. Okay, um for this part here, uh uh generally it, it doesn't really matter if you uh, do it like this because um uh, uh, most of the time we are going to deal with uh, uh, x being continuous, yeah. So, so, um, so if x is continuous, then the equal sign here uh, is not important, huh? because uh, at single points the the, the measure is uh, the probability measure is zero, right? Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. So this is uh, Cantelli's uh, inequality. Now we have uh, learned um, three three inequalities here. Then um, okay. Uh, so before we move on, uh, so uh, is it okay for everyone these inequalities? Yes, doctor. Okay, uh, let, let me just uh, show some cal uh, examples, All right? So you have, let's say, um, suppose your X, right, is, um, um, your X is uh, chi square, right? I square with with uh, one degree of freedom. Okay, maybe okay. Let's say ten degrees of freedom. So the chi square of ten degrees of freedom will look like this. It has a mean that is uh, the mean of the chi square is equal to its degree of freedom, right? So around ten. Okay, so suppose you say you you want to find the probability that. Um, Let's say uh, x, right, uh, exceeding 10. Okay, so if you use uh, uh, Cantelli's, in, uh, sorry, if you use Markov's inequality, it says that this is basically bounded by uh, expectation of uh, x. So here your x is not negative, right? Is bounded by expectation of x over 10. So is it useful here? Um, here your expectation is still 10. So this is 10. So this is basically uh, trivial, right? So this is trivial. Okay, so um, so this is not very useful. Uh, let me see if, if let's say you have uh, 20. So let's say you have 20, right? That means uh, over here. So, so basically this, pro this tail, right? It is saying that, okay, without calculating it, uh, it says uh, the probability of this will be bounded by, uh, so it'll be 20, right? Be bounded by one over two. Okay, that means this, 
pro this tail here, right, cannot be more than uh, 50%. Okay? And, and so on, right? And so on. Okay? Now, if you try to use uh, other, so this is based on Markov's inequality. Right, so how about uh, Cantelis? So Cantelis inequality uh, says the following. So P of X minus mu. Okay, just to recap, right? Uh, alpha square, okay. So here, um, your mu is already 20, so Okay, so let me see. Uh, so mu is 10, right? So mu is 10, so you take alpha equals to 10. Then you will get um, 20, all right? So you take this to be 10, you take this to be 10, so you get 20, like here. So this will be bounded by the variance. Now, the variance of the uh, uh, chi-square is twice of its uh, degree of freedom. So you've got two, times 10 over 2 times 10 plus 10 square. Okay, so let's see what you get. So you get 20 here, so you get um, 20, 120. So this is 1, 6. Right? Oh, you can compare these two bounds. Which is, but, which is uh, sharper? Which one is sharper? Sharp, sharp in this case means uh, uh, tight, right? That means uh, it's close to the truth. Of course, this probability has a value, right? It's basically an area under the curve, right? It is, this is basically a bound, right? So if, if, if a bound is sharp, that means this bound is very close to, is closer to the, uh, the truth. Which one is, should be closer? This one or this one? Which bound is uh, sharper? The Cantelli or the Markov in this case? Seems that it's Contelli, it's Contelli because it's a smaller value, right? This means it's sharper and closer. Yeah, that's right. Usually the sharper one is the one that is smaller, uh, because the bound that is smaller is basically use, more useful, right? Because you know that it won't, it, it, at most it goes to until this level, uh, this uh, particular level. So if this value is high, it's basically useless. Like you, you bound a property with, uh, the property is bounded by two. It's basically a useless statement because I know that it's already bounded by one, right? So you say it's bounded by two. Of course, it is a true statement, right? You can even say it's bounded by 100, right? Uh, but it's basically a useless statement uh, because uh, not very helpful because uh, it's too, the, the bound is too, too wide. Huh? So uh, you're admitting too many um, possibilities, all right? Okay, just for curiosity, uh, so we may actually want to calculate uh, what this probability is. So I'm going to just uh, calculate it in R. Just a minute, yeah. So the actual value is uh, from R is 0 0.029. So one over six, Sorry, uh, am I doing it correct? Here. Uh, 
zero point zero two nine. Did I make some cal mistakes in calculations here? So this one is, the actual value is 0 0.029. Oh, it's correct lah. So one, sorry, but one over six is what? Uh, one over six is half of, uh, half of one third, right? So one third is uh, 0 0.333 something, right? So half of this is 0 0.167, uh, cor correct? Uh? Okay, so, so uh, of course this bound is better than this bound. Uh, this is 0 0.05, uh, so sorry, this is 0 0.5, okay? So this is, uh, put it on a line here, it is, uh, this is zero, so answer is here. So this bound is, here and 0 0.5 is here. Right? So this bound is definitely uh, sharper, right? Okay, so this is an example. Um, so let me look at another example. So let's say, um, Suppose your x is normal. Standard normal, yeah, okay. Um, so you, you, can, you cannot use the, uh, the result of Markov's inequality that is uh, uh, positive. Okay, but uh, you definitely can do the following. So you could uh, have, you could find this bound. Let's say you could have this. All right, so um, for example, if you choose, if you want to make things a bit simple here, you could actually square this. This is one possibility. So basically you choose k equals to two, right? Um, uh, if you choose that basically, or of course basically then, then that will be basically just your Trebuchet's uh, bound, right? It's okay, we can try that. So, so uh, over here, I know that my uh, expectation of x squared is basically one, right? Because uh, your mean is zero. So, so basically uh, this is variance x plus expectation of x squared, right? So this is one, this is zero. So basically you have one, okay? So I know that this is bounded by one uh, over alpha squared. So, uh, but this one is basically the same as this, right? Yeah, because, because of symmetry, right? Um, so you have this result. Uh, and basically these are the same thing, yeah? Because uh, since this is centered at zero, so you want it to be, so alpha is positive, yeah? So alpha here, uh, minus alpha here. So these two parts are symmetric, right? So basically you can say that this is twice of um, the tail, the right tail. And therefore you can have uh, a bound that is like this. Okay. So um, yeah, so, so this kind of inequalities can help you uh, get bounds for probabilities. And this can be useful when you do theoretical work, right? Because sometimes uh, evaluating the, the, the value of a property is unnecessary and it may be very uh, difficult to evaluate. Um, and so therefore, uh, an alternative is to work with bounds, right? And to work with bounds, you must know some, some of these uh, inequality results, okay? So let's say, suppose, let's check, right? If your alpha is uh, 1.96, we know that um, P of 
x greater than 1.96 is what? Anybody? From normal distribution, 1.96, magic number. If this is 1.96, what is this tail amount? Anyone? Zero point zero two five. Okay, great. Uh, Suta. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, close to two, eh? right? Close to two. So you know the the empirical rule, right? Plus minus two is about ninety five percent. Yeah, cover ninety five percent. So this is one side only. So it's half of ninety. Uh, half of the remaining five percent. So that's uh two point five percent, right? So I I know that it's uh zero point zero two five. Let's say what the bound. Is right. So the bound here is uh, one over two, one point nine six square. This is about. Um, I'm just a bit. I'm just going to take this as two. So this is roughly about one over eight. Uh, zero point one two five. Okay. So this. Uh, so you get a bound like this. If you want to, you can compare it with the uh, result that you get from uh, Contelli. We use Contelli. Uh, Contelli then, uh, you basically have the following. Um, this is Contelli. Okay, so you have, uh, so Contelli, let's say uh, you have this. Right, so here your mu is zero and your alpha is 1.96, right? So, and your variance here is one, so you basically have x greater than or equals to 1.96 bounded by 1 over 1 plus 1.96 squared. This is about 1 over 5. Okay. So 1 over 5. So not so good, yeah? So for well, Cantelli's uh, bound is actually not as sharp as your Markov's uh, bound in this case. Okay, so all these bounds, they, it's not like uh, one of them will always win. Yeah? Um, it depends on circumstances. Sometimes certain bounds are, are better in certain situations. All right, so this is just an illustration of what you can do with this. Uh, these results, right, for certain distributions. Okay. Right, okay, so um, I think we will, let's uh, take a break uh, now, take a 10 minute break now and um, then we come back, right, uh, with uh, some additional results for inequalities. So I'm going to pause the recording now. Okay, um, so let's uh, continue, everyone. All right. Uh, <clears throat>
Okay, so here uh, in this section, we are going to talk about um, a few things. Uh, uh, first, uh, we talk about something called a convex function. Right. Before we come to the uh, inequalities, uh, we talk about a kind of function uh, called a convex function. So the opposite is the uh, concave. Uh, th this is the opposite, right? So what is me meant by a, uh, a convex function? So, uh, so we can say the following. Okay. So, uh, so let's say you have. Uh, Function that's uh, going like this. This is this is a function f. Okay. Now, if you have two points here, let's say this is x one. So this is your x. This is your f x. Okay. And you have another point here. So this is x two, right? Then you draw a <clears throat> you draw a secant line through these two points. Okay, so so you have uh, these two points, right? This is a secant line, right? And then uh, you will see that uh, this will be. So then you consider any point within uh, this interval x one and x two, and this point is constructed by as follows, p times x1 plus q times x2. So your p plus q is equal to one. These are basically just a proportion. Uh. So, so if you uh, take a weighted form of x, these two points, you will get some point that's in between. Yeah? All right. Okay. So, now, if you so if you evaluate, um, so this is it. So let me see. This one is uh, this is this is your function. So this is uh, let's say your uh, linear linear function here. This is y. Yeah. Okay. Now you can see the following um, y. So at this point, it is uh, okay. So at this point, so this this uh, you make a projection from here to there. You basically have uh, so this value here is basically f of p x one plus q x two, right? This point, okay. You're basically evaluating it at uh, this particular point, right? Whereas over here, so this this part here is um, um, it will be something like this. P of uh, f. So this is a this is a the. So this value here is your y of p x one plus q x two. And um, it comes to here as the following. Okay. <clears throat> so you can you can basically build a linear equation uh, since you know x one and x two, and you know the slope, right? So the the slope here you can tell, right? So the slope here this will be uh, basically f x two. This is the height, so over here this is fx1. So the height here is uh, fx2 minus X, fx1 over the base is x2 minus x1, right? Okay, so, so basically uh, you can construct an equation for this uh, linear uh, secant line. 
And then after you have that second line, uh, if you plug in this value here, PX1 plus QX2, you will get this result, all right? So I, I will skip those uh, details later, uh, which you um, can follow later in the notes, yeah? All right. So basically, it's, it's nothing much. It's basically you have a linear equation here. You substitute PX1 plus QX2, you will get uh, this particular value, right? And this is the value evaluated at uh, the curve F, okay? So very clearly from geometrical consideration, right, you will see that your F of PX1 plus QX2 is lower than or equals to, so this value is bounded by this value, right? P of X, FX1 plus Q of FX2. Okay. All right, so this is uh, an equality for convex function. So your, if your function is convex, it means uh, if you draw a second line on it, this, uh, this particular value here, yeah, will bound this particular value, okay? So you have an uh, inequality like this. So this inequality occurs for convex functions, right? If you have concave functions, Concave functions, basically you flip, right? So basically you have a function that goes like this. Concave, uh, something like this, okay? This looks like the entrance. How to remember con convex and concave? Uh, roughly, you can see concave, right? See the word cave here? So this, if a function looks like this, this looks like the entrance of a cave, all right? So, so um, Otherwise, you, you always get confused with convex and concave. So the convex is basically the opposite of concave, that's it. So, so you have, again, you draw a second line, right? So you draw a second line, you have these two values. Okay, so again, you have Px1 plus Qx2. Okay, so you make a projection here, and you also have a projection here. All right. Uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, just a minute. So okay. Um, so basically, over here you will have. Um, P of fx1 plus Q of fx2, and this will be F of Px1 plus Qx2. So again, uh, in this case, they will dominate, right? Your, your function here will dominate, right? So F of Px1 plus Qx2 will dominate this thing, okay? So basically, uh, it's very simple. Convex, the function of uh, some weighted average is bounded by the this uh, weighted average of the function, and when it's concave, you just reverse the sign, right? So you just need to remember one of them, and uh, the other is just you flip the inequality. Okay, so this inequality is obtained from geometry. Purely, it's a purely geometrical uh, inequality. Okay, in case you wonder how a lot of these inequalities come about, they basically refer to some facts in geometry. Okay, so if, if you, uh, that's why I, I, I encourage you to always think of things geometrically because uh, that would help you uh, solve a large class of such problems, yeah, that are based on geometry. Okay, so we have this, uh, this uh, result. And now we are ready to talk about uh, something called the uh, Jensen's inequality. Let me just clear some space here. So now we can talk about Jensen's inequality. Okay. Now, Jensen's inequality states the following. Um, 
the function of an expectation of x is bounded by the expectation of the function of x. Okay. If you look at this uh, form, right? So this is uh, basically, so this is your function, right? This expectation of x, basically you are giving a weight, right? For each of the possible values of x, right? You're putting a weight. So this p, q here plays the role of the weight. In fact, in fact, this one can be extended to uh, multi-dimensional. That means you have p1, x1 plus p2, x2 plus until p and x n, right? It will be true. But of course, then you won't have this geometrical uh, object, right? Uh, that you can sketch here. But it is the uh, is analogous, right? So this part here plays the role of your expectation, and this part here you see these are the weights, right? Okay. So again, uh, so these are the evaluations f of x. So it becomes the expectation of uh, uh, f of x. Okay. So Jensen's inequality uh, shows this if f is convex. Okay, so if f is convex, you have this result, Jensen's inequality. So now uh, let's look at some um, examples. So let me just write it again. Okay, the function of expectation of x is bounded by the expectation of the function of x, sorry, uh, f is convex. Okay, let's think of some uh, convex functions. Let's think of some convex functions. Anyone? Let's think of some, the convex function should generally uh, behave like this, right? So that you put a, any function where you put a secant line, uh, so the, this part here, right, for any two points within, so this value is bounded by, so this value dominates this value, so you will have uh, convexity. So any ideas? Simple ideas. Give a simple idea of a convex function that you can think of. X square. X square. Okay. So x square goes like this, right? So we put a secant line like this. So definitely, uh. Definitely, so let's say second line like this. So definitely any point within is dominated by the point on the line, right? So yes, x square, which means you have, if f is x square, then expectation of x. So this is the, the argument, right? So square, all right, will be bounded by the expectation of x squared, which means uh, your uh, yeah. So basically, which means the square of the mean is bounded by the second moment. Okay. It's an interesting result. Um, and of course, uh, why is it so? Actually, this right is, is actually, um, 
you can you can rearrange it, right? So basically, you rearrange it, you get you rearrange, you get the following. And what is this? Anyone can recognize this? Is variance. Yeah, variance of x. Which is basically trivial. This is a trivial result, right? Because the variance of x is okay. Is a net your variance of x is a non-negative quantity. So basically, if you apply Jensen's inequality with uh, uh, the quadratic function, you basically recover the trivial result, the trivial uh, relationship, which is the variance of x must be non-negative. Okay. So that is nice, but um, uh, it leads to something that is uh, already uh, trivial. So can we look at other examples of convex functions? You don't have to go far, just use the common ones that you come across. Anyone? If it's x squared plus one. X squared plus one, it is still, yeah, it will be still convex. You will also get some inequality. So then you will get these results. Uh, x squared plus one, is it? Yeah. X is x squared plus one. So then you will have, um, uh, let me see this one plus one expectation of uh, x square plus one which you can see that it leads back to the same thing because your constant cancels okay so adding a constant uh, will lead to the same inequality what other function that you use all the time? Very common. Exponential of x. Okay, that's great. Exponential of x, so how does it look like? Exponential of x is going like this. So definitely, con um, Definitely convex, right? Because it's going up like this. So you pick any two points, put a second line. So definitely uh, any point with Vivian is on the second line and dominating. Okay. So your E of X, Fx, E of X is convex. So, so if it's convex, then you can apply this inequality. So see, let's see what we get. Um, so expectation of so exponentiation of uh, so replace x with e of x uh, expectation of e x okay which basically means uh, e of uh, mu is bounded by expectation of e power of x which means uh, you can further get some results uh, mu less than log of e of e x. Right. So you know that, uh, well, it depends on what you want, right? So if you are interested to find out the expectation of this random variable, 
you know that uh, is uh, the lower bound is uh, e power of mu, uh, okay? And depending on what you want to do, you it, sometimes this form is okay already enough, or sometimes you might want to look at the log form or whatever. So just to let you know. So this is very interesting here. You notice that if you put a t here, you will get uh, something like this. So uh, I mean, you you basically take uh, e of tx, right? So basically you will have this, and what is this form? Anybody recognizes this? Expectation of E to the power of Tx. What is it? Moment generating function. Yeah, correct. So this is the moment generating function. So the moment journey function is bounded, it has a lower bound given by E of T mu, where mu is the mean. And this one, uh, so you can further uh, find uh, if there are inequalities related to exponential function, you can connect, you can further connect, right? So, so, um, so yeah. So sometimes when you see inequalities that involve these kind of things, the first thing is to start thinking about that they are probably uh, obtained using this kind of uh, Jensen's inequality uh, with certain convex functions. Okay, so here are two examples. Um, of course, we know that if the function is concave, right, this will flip for concave. Okay, so give me some examples of a concave function. You can also get inequalities, but uh, in the, the sign is reverse. Minus of x square minus of x square uh, like this. So flip down, okay? Okay, this is concave. Um, so if you have, if you do it like this, I think you will get something back like this result. You know why? Okay, then you will get minus of expectation uh, of x square greater than or equals to expectation of minus of x square. Okay. Uh, you know you have minus sign, minus sign here, so you multiply both sides with negative, so the negative will cancel. And this sign will reverse when because you multiply by negative. So you basically get back the original result here. So that, that uh, just by introducing a sign to it, um, uh, basically will lead to the same inequality that that you get without the sign. So maybe we try some other functional forms. Yeah, you got something like this, right? What is some some other function that is closely related to the exponential function? Log x. Ah, okay, log. It's uh, it's nemesis, right? Because when the log meets the the exponent, they they kind of like kill each other, right? Because it's the uh, it's the inverse function. Okay, so you have this. You take f x equals to log of x, right? So then you will have so. Okay, if you sketch log x, log, log x is like this. Okay, um, so it keeps on going like this. So this is one, so this is zero, right? So basically when you draw, you put a second line through it, um, you see that at any point, right? Any point in between, 
the point on the curve is dominating the point on the straight line, okay? So the result will flip, okay? It's very simple. So, so any function that you want to consider, just do a sketch. That's where your, your calculus skills, eh, uh, come, come, calculus skills come into, into the picture. Eh? If, if, you, if your calculus is a bit rusty, it is a bit, uh, you need some practice eh, to, to like graph sketching and things like that. Because otherwise, uh, it's very hard for you to determine whether a function is concave or convex. So now you know this is concave. So I know that the log of e of x, okay, will be larger than or equals to the expectation of log of x, okay. So in this case, I in fact I get an, an interesting result, which is the expectation of the random variable log of x is bounded by the log of mu, where mu is the expectation of x. All right, interesting, right? Because you, you, with, so just by applying this inequality, you get a bound for some random variable. And this random variable may be, this expectation may be very hard to calculate depending on what is your x, what is the distribution of x. Um, and in fact, without doing, by just applying the inequality, you already have an idea about its bound. Huh? Like it, it cannot exceed certain value, right? So this is useful information as well. Okay, so let's take one more example uh, before we move on. One more example for a concave function. A very simple one. You have been seeing this function uh, appearing quite often just now in the Markov uh, Trebuchet inequalities. What function is that? Anyone? What function did you see just now in the Markov and Trebuchet inequality? Normal. Huh? Normal. The normal distribution uses the exponential function. So the normal, I mean like normal distribution is just a name for a function that uses exponential function. So we already covered exponential function just now. Of course, uh, E of minus X, right? Uh, is decaying like this, right? So what is this? Is it? Concave or convex? Concave or convex? Yeah, it's convex, right? Okay, because uh, at any point between your the value evaluated at the uh, straight line is uh, dominating uh, the value on the curve, right? So, so yeah, this one is. Uh, on X. So of course you can derive, uh, re, uh, I leave it to you, uh, okay? So again, uh, yeah, Suta said something like this. So this is also, um, okay, interesting, this one. This one, um,
Hmm. So this is also convex, right? Okay. You look at a con uh, concave function. Very simple one just now. In the inequalities, what do you see coming out very often? So Markov's inequality. What function do you see here? X power to three. X to the power of three. Well, um, I think it's something like this, right? The uh, sorry. It uh wait okay. x to the power of three if you have zero between zero and one it will become very small right become very small and then after that it will start to shoot very quickly okay so Put any two points. The thing with this x power three is that um, it's not so simple. The the convexity, uh, it's the convexity and uh, is only defined over certain intervals. All right. Like for example, over here you'll find that part of it is uh, I think this part, this part here is actually concave, but this part here is uh, convex. So, so not so simple, all right? Uh, it's convex for x greater than zero and concave for x negative. So um, maybe a bit hard to use this inequality. Uh, yeah, because it will depend on, on the particular intervals of x that you take. Just, just do something simple. What is common here? What function is common here? It's very obvious. And sometimes the most obvious thing is the hardest to spot, right? Because it seems like you, you, it's not special enough for you. Then you don't spot it. You got some very weird functions like sine, hyperbolic function, uh, those attract your attention. But here you see, you, you kind of like miss it. Can anybody see it, the function? It's a very humble function. Humble, humble people are missed all the time, right? People go for the flashy type. Anyone, anyone? Yeah, that's right. I saw right. Uh, uh, ice war. Well, yeah, absolute function. Absolute of x. Uh, so absolute of x is actually wait. This is uh. Oh, this is actually concave. Uh, this, sorry, this is actually con, con, convex. All right, sorry, I, I messed up. All right, so yeah. Okay, I wanted to say something about the absolute function, but this is actually convex, right? Because uh, you put any two points, uh, the line is dominating, right? So it's actually a 
convex, convex, convex. Okay, never mind. So um, this is actually convex, right? Okay. Square root of two, uh, square root of x. Okay, interesting. Um, square root of x, you will have Mm, like this, right? Okay, square root of x. And it's definitely concave, all right? So that's good. Uh, because if your x, your x square is convex, right? So it's uh, inverse. Uh, so in this case, uh, you have, uh, let's say, for positive, right? For positive values, you can invert it. And um, the square root of x will be only for positive x eh, will be concave, right? Okay, because uh, any two points, your value on the curve is dominating the value on the line, okay? All right, okay, so good. So for that, we will have, uh, for example, we will have a square root of expectation of x will be larger than or equals to the expectation of square root of x, okay? which gives you expectation of x is greater than um, the square of the expectation, all right? Okay, so you get some inequality like this. Um, Okay, so I, I think that's all I want to talk about for Jensen's inequality, all right? Uh, we have looked at uh, quite a few examples, yeah? Okay, then uh, we move on to... Uh, a result called Holder's inequality. So Holder's inequality says the following. Uh, uh, if 1p plus 1q is equal to 1, and then the absolute of x times y is bounded by this result. So we're not going to look at the proof uh, a bit involved. Uh, we're just going to learn how to use it, all right? Okay, so of course your expectation of absolute x must be finite, expectation of y must be finite, all right? Otherwise, this will not hold. Um, so yeah, so if you have, uh, if 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1, this is a constraint, then it says that uh, you have this result, all right? So this is a... Um, like, so you can get all kinds of results, like for example, the P is equal to, so one over P plus one over Q must be equal to one. So if your P is two, then you can take Q equals to two, right? Okay, so this is a special case, right? When your P is equal to Q equals to two, then you have expectation of absolute X, Y is founded by expectation of x squared because uh, if you have two then absolute you can remove the absolute sign right because the square then this is a uh, one over two so the square root square root all right um, so basically uh, yeah so this this is what we call a uh, Schwartz Schwartz uh, inequality Okay, now Schwartz's, Schwartz's equality is a very interesting uh, result. Suppose you replace uh, x with the centered form, x minus uh, mu x. Then y with uh, y minus mu y, right? Let's look at what you will get. So you get expectation of um, x minus mu x. Uh, y minus mu y bounded by 
square root of expectation of x minus mu square, which is right. All right, okay. So this is basically your variance of x, and this is your variance of y. Okay, so basically you have um, the following following result, right? Um, the 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 expectation of this thing, right, is um, so. This is uh, yeah. You have your expectation of this thing is bounded by the square root of uh, the product of your two two uh, variances. In fact, um, this part here is your. Um, let me see. This will be this is something like your covariance. <clears throat> Except that um it's got an absolute sign here. So this is something like a covariance like a, a quite a random variable. Okay, so you, you know that uh, you have some, some result like the covariance of x, y um, divided by the square root of uh, the variance of x times variance of y. This is your correlation, right? Between x and y. Okay, so this, this uh, Schwartz inequality gives you some related results. Okay, when you make substitution. Okay, so the uh, special case is uh, Schwartz uh, in inequality. Um, of course, for other cases, you can uh, try out, like for example, if you take p is equal to 3, then your 1 over q must be equal to 2 over 3, and therefore q must be 3 over 2. So then this would give you some result like this. Um, it's, it will be a bit complicated. Um, there will be absolute power of 3, that's a square root, then um, E of absolute Y, 3 over 2, and you have uh, 2 over 3. Okay. Um, yeah, so for your level, I think uh, most of the time, um, you will be just concerned with the special case of holders inequality, right? Because the other uh, situations with different values of uh, P and Q, uh, when your P goes to 3 and all that, then your Q starts to get complicated and uh, they may be useful for some more advanced work, but uh, generally at this level, you, you don't need to use them, right? So you will just uh, use, uh, restrict yourself to Schwartz inequality. Now let's see what kind of uh, results we can get from Schwartz inequality. So this from here, okay, maybe I just erase, uh, clear the board. So I have uh, Schwartz inequality. Expectation of uh, absolute x, y is bounded by uh, square root of expectation of x square, expectation of y square, okay? Okay, so... So suppose if y is equal to um,
let's say log of x. Then I would have expectation of absolute x log x uh, bounded by Okay. Um, so so basically, you can uh, just plug in, right? Right, some other examples like let's say if your y is 1 over 1 plus x square, then your expectation of uh, absolute x over 1 plus x square will be bounded by expectation of uh, 1 over 1 plus x. Okay, maybe I just make it simple without the square. Okay, so with this uh, Schwartz inequality, you can basically, uh, uh, so it gives you another way to find uh, expectations of uh, bounds for expectations of random variables. Okay. So suppose we have some, let's look at something uh, that's uh, more concrete, right? Um, let's see. Um, so suppose your x uh, takes a certain, if your x uh, takes a particular kind of distribution, so let's look at what would happen. Mm. So for example, over here, you can also do something like this. Um, if you take y equals to log x over x, then you would get expectation of, um, you replace, you will get uh, absolute log, log y because uh, this, when it multiplies with x, it will cancel, but then you will get bounded by expectation of x squared times this. Okay, so so you can also uh, re you can also pick things like this. Uh, where sometimes the x can cancel with, with the x here, all right? So you can get some, so this is basically simpler. And once this becomes simpler, this, this part will become more complicated, right? So um, it may or may not be useful depending on, on how easy is it to evaluate this, this kind of functions. <clears throat> Okay, um, all right, okay, so I think, uh, so these are all the things that I want to talk about uh, for inequalities. All right. So uh, in the tutorials, you will have more uh, chance to practice on using this uh, inequalities, right, to, to get some useful results, okay? So um, tutorial five has been uh, posted. So uh, do take a look and uh, this, uh, on this Thursday, we will, um, so we will assign, uh, ask the students to, to look at some questions, right? So you can try it this week already and uh, we will discuss it next week. All right, okay, so that's all for today's uh, lesson, all right?
Uh, is there anything else you want to ask? Okay, uh, okay, if not, uh, maybe later when you have, um, when, when you work, work out the problems and you come across some questions, then you can ask later, all right? Okay, so that's all for today. Uh, thanks for listening.